There we go. Welcome on to the next of our live streams. It's the Bonnie Tess uh, Comrades Marathon webinar. My name is Brad Brown. It's great to have you with us this evening and uh, a great pleasure to be joining you from my house in Cape Town. We all uh, doing this remotely. We joined by the Comrades coach who is at his house in four ways. Lindsay Perry, welcome on to the live stream once again. It's good to have you on. Yeah, how's it, Brad? It hasn't been too long since the last one, but uh, quite a lot has changed since then. Uh, some, or mostly good news for runners anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, just before we do get into tonight's uh, sort of running order and, and, and what we're going to be chatting about and introducing our guest, I just want to make sure that everybody can see and hear us. If you can, please do just give us a thumbs up uh, or let us know in the comments uh, that you can hear us. Also, while you are commenting, if you wouldn't mind letting us know where you're joining us from tonight. Uh, and uh, if you are training for comrades, what number comrades is this? Are you a novice? Would this be your first down run? Uh, are you going for a back to back? Are you going for green? Let us know. Pop those in the comments. I see we're getting lots of likes, which is which is fantastic. I'm going to share my screen quickly just so that we can run through uh, what it was that we wanted to run through this evening. And uh, then we can take it from there. So Hopefully I can get the slides working. Uh, let me see if we can get those up the way they should be. And it doesn't seem to be wanting to work the way they should be. So let me stop the share. Uh, and Lindsay, just for, while I get that right, uh, just anything before we get going that you want to add? Obviously, we, we touched on it last time around with comrades being postponed. No, no date as of yet. But uh, yeah, we spoke about it at length last time around your your thoughts and and is there any other news that you can report on no look there's no news from from comrade side obviously um you know we are allowed to exercise outside now and that's as we discussed last time comrades is committed to you know supporting runners through this time and therefore we are looking to provide good advice on on what to do and what not to do really during these times, but yeah, I think my sentiment stays the same. I think if Comrades goes ahead this year, we'll be quite lucky. Um, and I think we will take that as a, a bit of a celebration and a privilege to be able to do so. But in the meantime, we want to stay active. We want to stay healthy. We want to stay fit and we don't want to overdo it. And those are really the, the central themes for today's um, webinar. Yeah, that's exactly what we are going to be running through tonight. So uh, let me pop that Try on again. <laughs> and hopefully, yeah, there we go. So it looks like everything is working the way it should be working. Uh, and let me click through the slides coming up on this evening's webinar. We're going to be talking about running outside again uh, and why we need to proceed with caution. We're going to chat about what we need to focus on over the next four weeks. Uh, motivation, staying motivated with no races on the horizon, uh, as well as exercise and the immune system. And we're going to share some of the best training resources around with you as well tonight. And then as always, questions and comments are always welcome. Please do pop them into the comments below. Uh, and then just some introductions. Who are we? Lindsay is the official Comrades Marathon coach. Uh, he's coached winners right through to thousands of uh, amateurs, uh, back of the packers, uh, like me. Uh, he's been to two Olympic Games, two Commonwealth Games as well, and he's got a marathon PB of 245. As I said at the start of the webinar, my name is Brad. I still don't have a marathon PB of 245. Uh, I've been around comrades my entire life. My dad's run 11. My brother's pretty close to green. Uh, I've run three myself. I ran my first one back in 2010. Uh, and if I can sort my foot out, we'll be back in 2020. And then our guest this evening, it's a great pleasure, and I'll do a proper introduction uh, when we do bring him in, is uh, Professor, professor Martin Schwellness. Uh, prof is a full professor of sport and exercise medicine at the Faculty of Health Services at the University of Pretoria uh, in South Africa. He holds uh, an MMBCH from the University of Witwatersrand, uh, an MSc med from the University of Cape Town, and an MD equivalent, uh, which is a PhD equivalent degree from the University of Cape Town. He's also a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. He's director of sport and exercise medicine at, at, and lifestyle institute at Semley in Pretoria. And he's also director of the International Olympic Committee Research Center in South Africa. Uh, Prof. Martin, welcome. Nice to, nice to have you on this one. Well, thank you very much. Also still working on my uh, PB for a marathon below <laughs> 2.45. That'll take me a lot. <laughs> Prof, you're making me feel so much better about myself. I'm glad I'm not the only one who doesn't have a 2.45 marathon PB. 
Uh, Prof, we're going to bring you in in a second. Obviously, we want to talk lots about uh, our immune system and training uh, and the dangers thereof training during times like these. But uh, let's just talk a little bit, Lindsay, before we do that, uh, a little bit about where we are right now and, and sort of what the focus should be with regards to comrades being the long-term goal. Obviously, it's a moving target because we don't know when that is going to happen. But where should we be right about now? The, the, the beauty, of course, um, and I'm glad you asked the question the way you did, because the beauty of where we are now and um, when comrades is most likely to be, which is in the third quarter, we don't know exactly when, but it's 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 going to be in the third quarter. So we really don't have to worry too much about comrades. And I think that for me is, is what I, I would love to stress in this particular webinar is that the things that we're doing now Sure, they're going to be laying the groundwork. They're going to be ensuring that we stay reasonably fit. Um, very importantly, they are hopefully going to ensure that we stay healthy. Um, but we don't need to and, and, and shouldn't be thinking about comrades right now. So I think thinking about comrades and focusing on comrades now will push people to, to go too hard too soon. So... Where we are right now is that most places in the world have come out of very hard lockdowns. And, and so pretty much everyone we're speaking to can run outside again. Um, and there will have been people that have gone five plus weeks and have not been able to run or have done some gardening running or maybe treadmill running, a little bit of cross training. Um, and it's important that we just ease ourselves back into running on the road again, make sure that we don't get injured, make sure that we don't overtrain and, and, and compromise the immune system, which uh, we're going to chat about a bit later in, in the slide. But essentially, we, we're in a space now where we're, we're allowed to run outside. Um, we want to continue doing the things that we did well during lockdown, which is focusing on strength training. Um, and we just want to make sure that we come out of this properly. So, um, you know, as we go through the the webinar will will as always we'll talk about two groups of people those that were able to train properly that had a treadmill and those that that didn't have um, a treadmill and and hopefully did a, a bit of um, cross training or at least strength training and then it's really just important that over the next um, two to three weeks we build back that volume up to a moderate level. Um, maybe some moderate in, in intensity in there, uh, but we don't want to be training really hard. We don't want to be pushing massive kilometers. Um, and we definitely, I mean, five weeks a long time. I've had quite a few clients who were really fit going in, haven't been able to run at all. And from some quite short runs, even with them having done strength training, are reporting DOMS. Um, and that's a classic example there of, of why we need to take it easy. Five weeks is a long layoff. We need to build up slowly again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lindsay, some great questions coming through. Something I forgot to mention at the start of this webinar as well. Uh, Lindsay mentioned the different uh, sort of types of lockdown that people are in. Obviously, here in South Africa, uh, we've moved to level four. We've got people around the world who are in uh, different sort of stages. Some can train outdoors all the time. Uh, obviously, here in South Africa, we're sitting in a situation where we can only train outdoors between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. And one thing we didn't want this to be is a platform to discuss that. We need to uh, play the cards that have been dealt to us. Uh, that is what it is. Uh, we're not going to change it, talking about it tonight. Uh, if you want to lobby government to try and get them to extend it, you're more than welcome to, but we can't do that on this platform. And we need to talk about what we've got in front of us. The last webinar, we spoke about comrades being postponed and what you can do. And we obviously adjusted training with regards to, to strength plans and, and doing stuff indoors. Like Lindsay said, if you had a garden running around there, where we're at now is there is some running available outdoors and we need to work within the constraints that we've been dealt by government. So that's what we're working with tonight. So if there are any things about the six to nine, we're not going to deal with those tonight because there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, just that I could get that out the way. Lindsay, let's talk about the next four weeks. What should we be focusing on uh, now that we've looked at where we, where we are right now? What should the focus be over the next sort of four, four weeks or so? Yeah, so again, I, I think it's important to to um, differentiate between the two groups and, and we'll do that as we go through. But, you know, our, our theme song 
here at Coach Perry is consistency. So we do want to maintain consistency. We want to keep training. Um, train, you know, run, from a running point of view, you want to be running three to four days a week. Uh, if you do have access, maybe some cross training, definitely some strength training. So I think that's, that's still for me a really key um, focus area from here. And we, and we don't have... We don't get many opportunities like we've got now. So look, there are a lot of negatives uh, associated with, with COVID, but, but honestly, one of the, the, the positives here is that we get to work on things that we typically don't get to work from because we stumble from one race to another. There's always the pressure to run a marathon, always the pressure to run an ultra marathon. Well, now we've, we've got this opportunity where, where we, we need to start out from, from scratch. Um, there is a long runway until we get to start racing again. And strength training is something that runners are notorious at neglecting. So, again, I'll emphasize that that for me is really key, that we continue to work on, on strength training. And then uh, some moderate intensity, and hopefully Prof will touch on, on why the low to moderate intensity and, and why to avoid the, the, the high intensity and then we want to limit the long runs and essentially it's for, for the same reason after really long runs um there is the possibility of some uh, immune suppression but away from the, the health things it's also important from mental strength point of view if you're going to train really hard from now then when the races return and those that were sensible during this time and laid a nice foundation and stayed fit healthy and strong are really going to benefit. They'll be able to train hard and they're going to, to do some really good running either at the end of this year or early next year. And those that were training really, really hard um, at this time are going to be mentally stale, physically tired. And when it comes time to actually start training for your events, you, you're not going to be able to get the best out of yourself. Cool. Lindsay, great question. It's from Denise. And I think that sort of runs perfectly into the next thing we wanted to chat about. Denise wanted to know, uh, obviously you've got training programs on the coach Perry, uh, on the, the comrades.com website. We've also got comrades training programs on the coachparry.com website. Are you going to change the comrades webs, uh, the, the comrades training plans because of where we are now? Uh, and I think that's probably what you want to chat about sort of going, going forward. So I think it's, it's a nice segue into, into what you wanted to chat about next. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, Without a doubt, those comrades programs are, are, are inappropriate for this time of the year, considering um, that A, the race has been moved, and B, we just can't sustain peak training. So as soon as we do have a date, I have committed to comrades that I'll rewrite all of those programs to match up with that date. So in the meantime, um, you know, as I was alluding to just now, we do have this unique opportunity now. We, we in South Africa in particular, are extremely focused on 42 Ks plus. You know? um, but we know from, from years and years of experience that the faster you run at 5 Ks, the faster you'll run at 42 Ks. Now, um, we're not, we don't all have the same strengths. You know? So I might be at a marathon slightly quicker than someone else relative to my 5k compared to someone else. But what I know is that if I improve my 5k time, my marathon time will improve. And we just never get the opportunity to work on 5, 10k um, times. And what's, what's really great about working on your 5 and 10k times is you can do that with moderate volumes of training um, and mostly moderate to easy um, intensities of training. Sure, you will need that one hard or, or, or fast run in the week, but again, by limiting the by limiting the volume of that that high intensity workout, you you can offset the negatives of pushing yourself too far. Um, so between between focusing on five and tens and working on your strength, I think those are two key aspects. And um, I think write down in your previous races, in your comrades, in your in your 21s, your 42s, whatever those races are, write down 
where you felt you were, were lacking on race day. Now you get the perfect opportunity to, 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 to work on those things. And the beauty of 5 and 10 Ks too is that they're easy to measure and they're easy to do on your own. You don't need a race to push yourself over 5 and 10 K. So we have the opportunity now to set up our own little time trials, 5 Ks, 8 Ks, 10 Ks. Um, you can even run your normal time trial loop from, from your club. Of course, you can't do it with your, your club mates, but you can go there and do them individually as long as it's between six and nine again if you are in South Africa. But we have this opportunity to really work on our 5 and 10K speed. Plus, we have opportunity and means to then go and test ourselves over 5 to 10K because it doesn't require big logistics. Um, and you know, with GPS watches, it's, it's really easy to, to measure those out. We're getting some great questions coming through with regards to this, Lindsay. And one of the questions, it's from Debbie O'Leary. De you mentioned the, the limiting your long runs at the stage. De Debbie's asking, what would the longest run be? Would it be a half marathon? What would you suggest? Yeah, so look, these things are always a little bit harder to answer um, when you know very little about what people are training for and the level that they're at. But I would say that between... 18 and 25 kilometers so 25 kilometers really being your upper end now for long runs um and and even that would depend on your background you know for for me um you know literally even when i'm not training for anything i will generally run two hours on the weekend that's what i love to do and I, and, and it, it's very easy so so if if that is your background and your history um and you know, my, my, peak, my peak training is going to be in the region of 130 to 160 kilometers a week. So now I'm running um, 80, 75, 80, 85 Ks in the week. So for me, that 25 Ks is, is fine. It's not an issue. But I'd say for, for most people, somewhere in the region of 18 to, to 21, 22, and with 25 K kind of being your up, upper limit for a long run during these times. Yeah, and Saul made a very good point there. That's obviously within the five kilometer radius of home. I've seen Lindsay Strava and he's staying within the 5K. So that's definitely the case. And then Lindsay, something you, you, you touched on, but you talk about staying fresh now. The last thing you want to do, because we had a question and I'm going to ask the question. Uh, it's, let me see who it's just from. It's from Hussein. Hussein saying, is it okay to run a marathon on my own during, during this lockdown period? You're talking about staying fresh so that when Comrades does make an announcement, if it is on uh, later on this year, the last thing you want to do is start building up again and you knack it. Yeah, exactly. So look, we've all got different reasons for doing these things. Okay. So if you're going to run a marathon for charity, um, if you are somebody who who runs more for the completion of certain races and time isn't really um, a, a motivating factor for you look then you can build yourself up and you can do things like a 42k of course you can't in south africa because there's not a lot of people in south africa that can run 42ks in under three hours um, and so you'd have to do it between six and nine so that that that, that's also the obvious thing that, that stands out. Um, in terms of, of the, the kind of compromise to both immunity, mental freshness, physical tiredness, I also personally don't think that it's a, a really good idea. Um, I do know a few people that had trained for months and months and months and months for a marathon, and so that's what they were going to do. And in that scenario remove the three hour limitation but in that scenario okay for sure go for it do your marathon perhaps over two days now with that limitation but but then you need to give yourself a little bit of a break and you need to take a little break um, drop right down to minimal exercise probably rest from running for a bit do some cross training like cycling focus on strength training and give yourself you know two weeks or so just to mentally refresh and then you you build up slowly and you'll be two weeks behind the rest of us but that's okay because we've got loads of time leading into um the second half of the year 
Absolutely. Keep those questions coming through. We've had some great ones already. Please pop them into the comments. I also haven't asked if you uh, have got running mates or if you're part of a running club and you've got a, a group on Facebook or a WhatsApp group uh, that you guys chat amongst each other, please wouldn't you mind sharing this uh, live stream into those groups so we can uh, chat to or, or share this message with as many people as possible, particularly the next part of the webinar. Because as much as we are talking comrades, this is something I think that can benefit uh, all runners and all athletes. Uh, doesn't matter what distance you're training for. So uh, if you wouldn't mind hitting that share button, it would be massively appreciated. Before we bring Prof uh, Schwalness in, a, a quick question, Lindsay, from... Uh, from uh, Zanel, Zanel saying, would you suggest time trialing on a flat route or a, or a hilly route, uh, or should you rather uh, sort of add in routes with, with both at this time? I'm guessing a combination of both would be good at this time. So look, uh, the flat route is always going to give you the best results from a time point of view. So when it comes to testing yourself over time, trying to set PBs and race the fastest race you can brace, Flat route is always the way to go. Um, if where you live, that is very difficult, then because we're looking to improve on ourselves, as long as you are repeating that test or repeating the time trial on the same route, be it hilly or in between, that's, that's okay. Um, but if you can, flat. Flat and fast. That's what we're looking for for, for your, your test day. Brilliant. All right. Keep those questions coming. We love answering them. The more, the better. Uh, and yeah, please excuse me for reading this introduction. I, I mentioned at the start, we've got a special guest on the webinar tonight. And I, I really don't want to butcher this because uh, he has got an unbelievable uh, CV and we are really privileged to have him this evening. Uh, professor Martin Schwellness joins us. He's a full-time professor of sport and exercise medicine at the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He's also a specialist sport and exercise medicine physician who regularly consults with athletes of all levels. He holds holds an MBBC8 from the University of the Witwatersrand cum Laude, uh, an MSc Medicine from the University of Cape Town, as well as an MD, which is an equivalent to a PhD degree from the University of Cape Town, and is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. Uh, among the other responsibilities he holds, Prof. Schwellness is a director of the Sport, Exercise, Medicine and Lifestyle Institute, which is SEMLI at the University of Pretoria. He's been the director of the International Olympic Committee, the IOC Research Research Center in South Africa for the last 10 years, uh, is a long-standing member of the IOC Medical Commission uh, and is a member of the editorial board of a number of international journals, including the British Journal of Sports Medicine. He has an interest in a number of areas in sport and exercise medicine, notably the health benefits of regular exercise and the prevention of, and management of injuries and medical complications in active individuals. He promotes the safe prescription of regular exercise to all populations in order to reduce uh, reduce the risk, uh, the, gl the global burden rather, of non-communicable disease. He's an active researcher and has published over 300 scientific journal articles, chapters in books and conference proceedings. Professor Schwellness, it's an absolute pleasure to have you this evening. Welcome. And I'm going to hand the floor over to you. I know you've got a, a presentation you want to run through, and I'm sure it's going to answer a lot of questions, but it may raise a few. And if anybody's got any questions while Prost running through his slides, feel free to pop them into the, uh, into the comments, and we'll get those answered for you in a moment. Prof, over to you. Well, thank you very much, and <clears throat> thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, also for being part of this. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, Brad, I'm not sure how you're going to uh, do the slides for me. Prof, you just tell me when you want me to flick through. You should be able to see them, and I'll flick through to the next one. <clears throat> okay. I mean, this evening, <clears throat> we're going to touch on uh, four main things, I think. Uh, in order to introduce the whole issue of exercise, immunity, and infections, which is a very topical thing at the moment, I'm going to briefly just outline what I would call Immune System 101, just a few basic concepts about the immune system. Then we're going to touch on whether exercise uh, affects your immune system, particularly with a view of looking at whether exercise either protects you from infections, possibly, or predisposes you to infections. And we're going to talk about sort of two scenarios, um, a single exercise session, like uh, my cycle I run this morning, um, or my, uh, whether your immune system 
loves or hates regular training. And then lastly, I'm going to speak a little bit about when you have an infection and going back to uh, training and competition. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> all right, so to talk a little bit about the Immune System 101. Um, I mean, we all know, you should all know this, but your immune system is there to protect you. And it's protecting you against uh, diseases from uh, organisms, or we call them pathogens, uh, or even other foreign bodies that may enter or uh, attach themselves or be part of your body. And uh, your immune system is that part of your body that identifies and attacks uh, the variety of these external threats. And this includes uh, things like viruses, bacteria, and parasites. And the immune system is actually very clever in that it can distinguish these threats uh, mostly. And there are some diseases where it gets a bit confused. But in most instances, it can distinguish between uh, what is your own healthy tissue and the foreign tissue, which could be a virus or bacteria or something else. On the bottom of the slide, you'll see that in broad terms, and it's simplifying something that's quite complex, but in broad terms, the immune system has two parts to it. What we call a nonspecific, uh, born with, general uh, or innate immune system. And then a part of your immune system that uh, develops a memory and protects you from uh, invasions from organisms that it's been exposed to before. And that's your acquired immune system. We go to the next one, maybe. So this is a, a little bit of a tricky and complex slide, but it expands a little bit of what are the kind of things that we all have that are part of our non-specific or in, a innate immune system. And the first box there talks about physical barriers. And your skin is a very obvious one. Your skin is a physical barrier between yourself and your environment, and therefore protects you from uh, the environment, uh, which contains a variety of different uh, organisms and uh, foreign bodies. But what's perhaps not always appreciated is that various uh, orifices in your body, in your mouth and your nose would be an, an, an important one, your eyes would be another one, ears, etc. But these orifices uh, then go into a system uh, like the uh, lungs, uh, the respiratory system. And in that system, there is another protective layer, which we call the mucous membranes. Uh, these are the ones that produce mucus in the nose and the throat and, and, and uh, the, the lungs. And these mucous membranes also have um, tissue, uh, which we call lymphoid tissue, which protects you uh, from uh, organisms. The th <clears throat> second box there on humoral, humoral means chemicals really. And your body also has a variety of different chemicals that it produces and that lies sometimes within these uh, mucous membranes that also protect you. And then finally, the last bit uh, are various cells, usually your um, uh, cells which reside in the blood, but also cells that uh, can uh, be in your mucous membranes and be attracted when a foreign body enters the system. And these are by and large your white cells. Uh, we call them the neutrophils mostly, but they're also specific cells that also attack uh, an invading organism or a foreign body, uh, particularly cells called uh, macrophages or natural killer cells. The next, uh, the next one. So in terms of the uh, so-called acquired immune system, I'm not going to go into that, but this is the immune system that gets activated when, for instance, a virus uh, enters the body um, and there is a, a, a reaction by the body that um, develops chemicals and develops specific uh, proteins called antibodies. And these then are, are uh, resident in your blood and circulate there until the next time when you have an infection, uh, there's a binding or recognition of the antibody of the particular organism. And then this results in the organism being uh, killed by uh, the antibody complex together with cells. Um, this is how we get vaccinated against viruses. It's, uh, we uh, inject or administer a, a, a protein or a part of a virus that's very uh, similar to the live virus, and your immune system, the acquired immune system, makes an antibody against that, and this stays in your system uh, and uh, protects you from a further or second uh, infection by the same uh, organism. Next one. 
So this uh, is a slide that shows a little bit more about the respiratory tract, uh, which is obviously very topical at the moment with COVID-19. Uh, this is where pathogen in, in a virus goes into your system and your innate immunity uh, is the first protection. And again, this is very topical for COVID-19 because it is an entirely new uh, virus that nobody has developed this acquired immunity to. So our innate immunity is what uh, fights this virus at the moment. It's always there, as I said before. It acts quite fast uh, and it protects against any threat, including a new one. The difficulty is it's not very specific. It uh, does not really remember a previous uh, threat. That's not 100% true, but there are some uh, chemicals that are uh, related to some memory. And it is not as effective um, as against um, uh, a pathogen where you have an antibody to. Uh, part of the race against COVID-19 is to make a vaccine and the vaccine will then uh, be administered to people and uh, that will develop the left-hand side, the acquired immunity. So this is if you've been previously exposed and you develop uh, the, or, uh, the same virus comes into your system, it acts a little bit slower uh, but it's very specific. Um, it does remember and it's very effective. And so this is what we are lacking at the moment with COVID-19 is we haven't got a virus to which people uh, can, be, they can be vaccinated and therefore be protective. Next one. Sorry, Brad, can you give me the next slide? All right. Okay, so that's enough about the immune system. I think as long as we understand that we've got an innate immunity, a general immunity, and then we've got a, um, a acquired immunity. And both those systems are operative, operative, operative in our body all the time. So if we now focus on the next question, which is what about an uh, exercise session or with, with regular training? Uh, does exercise affect your immune system? And the first uh, point there is absolutely. Your immune system is... Right, sorry, Prof, it looks like we just seem to have lost you. Lindsay, are you still with us or have you... I am here, yes. You asked, it looks like we've just lost the prof, unfortunately. It uh, looks like his machine is frozen. So we'll try and get the prof on in just a second. Lindsay, while I, I sort that out and, and we get the prof back on, just a quick question from Jennifer Hoy Fuller. Uh, Jennifer's saying, my Strava Fitness says I've lost 50% uh, of my fitness since the 11th of March. Uh, she, she came down with a cold then. Uh, and then went into into lockdown. Uh, she says this is devastating for my confidence and ability to make comrades this year. How accurate are the calculations on Strava, and should I be taking note of this metric in my planning for comrades? Look, they are all based on algorithms, um, and as as soon as we went into lockdown, I actually went and started to do some digging around, and I, I found a couple of papers that all sort of pointed to the, the, the same thing. Um, and that's that even with no exercise whatsoever, we only lose around two to 4% of our fitness per week. Um, so look, that adds up over five weeks. So of course we have lost a bit of fitness. And as I alluded to earlier in the, the webinar, um, this, the kind of muscular skeletal and strength gain or losses are probably more significant than the loss of cardiovascular fitness. Um, but the good news is, is that there is loads of time between now and whatever date comrades may or may not happen. I mean, honestly, it's not, it's not going to happen um, before September. So the absolute earliest comrades is going to happen would be sometime in September, which gives us loads of time. It means that we only need to get back to our peak training levels kind of july sometime late july probably so you've got time um 50 percent sounds way too much to me um i mean i obviously don't know enough about your individual training but assuming you did some exercise during lockdown 
fifty percent just seems um, basically. I mean, you, you need to be bedridden to lose that much fitness. So don't don't put too much stock in that kind of technology. It is just a, a rough guide. Um, build up slowly. Uh, work on your consistency. And um, you will be fine by the time they announce the, the date. So, a- again, as I stressed in the previous webinar, we will get given um, inadequate warning to get ready to tackle comrades. Cool. We're still waiting for the prof just to get back on. Uh, hopefully, his uh, internet connection hasn't been load shed, uh, but we will get him on in just a second. Lindsay, a couple of questions. Let me ask this one we did cover it a bit when we when we first started the chat uh but it's from uh martin and we obviously spoke about where we should be right now and what we should be focusing on martin wants to know can you give us a rough guide with regards to the medals like we normally do on these webinars where you should be right now you've basically said we should back off totally and then once comrades announces a date that's when we should start picking up again what 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 about the people who are thinking that they need to be doing a certain amount of mileage or or training a certain amount if they're chasing a specific medal at comrades yeah so look that's exactly what i what i was actually steering away from and and why it's not there um because that's the again that's that's very specific thinking to to comrades and comrades being around the corner, which it's not. So I, I think I think we need to almost readjust it and for Martin to give him a, an, an idea. I mean, I'm not sure what, what medal he's, he's training for, but think about yourself being in January, February perhaps, but, but probably January. Think about the training that you were doing in the program that you were following in January, only just starting to kind of ramp up and start working towards a marathon, except I'm telling you don't work towards a marathon, work towards the 510 and a real stretch, a, a half marathon. So I don't know, for, for, for um, people looking to, to finish comrades, if it should happen this year, I would, I would say you, you're looking at, three to four runs of between eight and 12 Ks a week. Um, uh, the bronze medal guys are, are very similar, but maybe a, a, a 15 to 18 as, as your long run. Um, if you are training for a, a Robert Macholi or Bill Rowan, then you know, you're, you're probably running four days a week between eight to 15 Ks um, on your shorter runs and, and 15 to 20 Ks on your, your longer run um, and if you're training for a or if you're silver medal type sort of level runner and looking for a sub 14 and a 10k that kind of runner then you you're probably looking at in the region of three to five runs at uh you know between 10 and 15 k's and and one run between 20 and 25 k so that'll give you a, a very rough idea of, of kind of mileages for now Lindsay, a great question, and it is from Adewale. We still, just so you are aware, we're just trying to get the prof back on. There does seem to be a problem with his with his internet connection, but uh, keep the questions coming. We'll we'll answer questions for as long as it takes to get the prof back. Uh, Lindsay, a question from Adewale. Adewale wants to know, uh, as you say, if Comrades is going to be in September this year, how does that impact the build up to Comrades twenty twenty one, or or does it? No, so I mean, if so, let's assume comrades goes ahead at the end of the year. Then um, you are going to qualify for comrades twenty twenty one by finishing comrades twenty twenty. So it takes all the pressure off you for qualifying. Um, it means that you go into a really nice little uh, rest period, whatever that is. So, so again, this question for me to answer properly, I, I need a date. But you know, let's assume it's towards the end of the year. You you take a good little break and then. For the rest of the year, we will go back to chasing park runs and, and that sort of thing. And then um, <coughs> um, from January, we will get into our, our very normal build-up, although you, you, you won't have the pressure of needing to qualify in January and February. So maybe we'll focus on a 21 or a, or a 20 miler, a 32K, um, and we'll start training hard for comrades again in, in March 2021. Cool. Lindsay, a question from Manda Gomez. Manda's saying, 
I'm very concerned about the heat in KwaZulu-Natal in September, October. Obviously, we're speculating here because we're not sure when Comrades is going to happen. Uh, but should Comrades announce that the race is going to take place uh, in, in end of September or beginning of October, is there anything we can do now to start preparing ourselves for that added heat and humidity? You can. Um, and look, at, at that that time of year, so let's... let's, let's um make the assumption then that it is end of September, beginning of October. Around that time, it is hot. There's no question. It's starting to get really hot. The humidity is still under control, which is, which is a good thing because heat is an issue, but heat on its own is not the worst thing. Heat and humidity are, are really the killers. So um, uh, you can. Um, do you need to start now? Probably not. Um, we do adapt to this sort of stuff fairly quickly. But certainly as we get into those last, I'd say, 12 weeks leading into the race, you can get into a sauna. Um, once a week will, will make a difference. Twice a week will be good and three times a week will be excellent. Uh, you can do lunchtime runs. So if, if you live, I don't know where you, you live exactly, but let's, let's assume you do live in South Africa where, where morning and evening temperatures are really cool, but lunchtime temperatures are still fairly warm. Um, so you can do lunchtime runs. You can take it to the extremes, uh, run on a treadmill, um, put up the, put up the, the, the thermostat so it's quite warm, um, boil the kettle in the corner with the lid off to really get it humid. So there, there are loads of things that you can do uh, to, and, and we do acclimatize quite well to heat if, if we prepare in advance. And then similarly on race day, there are lots of things we can do to, control our, our body temperature when you do get to water points um, wet yourself because that cold and cool water will help you you to um, cool down slightly pack ice down the front of your shirt the back of your shirt under your cap that'll help you to cool down and of course there are quite a few garments um, on the market now that when you you sweat those garments actually undergo a chemical reaction and they get quite cold and then you've got this cold garments on your skin and, and and these garments often come as hats bandanas um shirts uh, arm sleeves so there's, there's various options but um yeah you, you, you need to work on some strategies and, and obviously if we are gonna go ahead and we are gonna run comrades and it is around those times we will dedicate a webinar um to preparing for uh, exercising in the heat as well as what to do when you are exercising in the heat Lindsay, a uh, question quick from, who's it from? Vilamina. Vilamina is saying, and, and this is one that we got asked on the last webinar as well. Obviously, we're talking again hypothetically that if Comrades does uh, announce that it is happening later on this year, what about qualifying? There's a, a whole bunch of people who haven't qualified yet for Comrades. Uh, what's, what's the story with it? Look, we don't know the answer to that, but we do know that Comrades have said that as soon as they um, know what's happening uh, with the date and importantly what's happening with other races they will make an announcement on, on what will happen with qualifying and if you know by some uh, by, by, if fate has it that comrades is the first race that it, that is back on the calendar they will put some criteria in place um, that will allow people who didn't have an opportunity to qualify to um, start the race you know there, there, there may be some there may be some individuals that would, would uh, lose out, I guess, if, you know, the furthest you've ever run in your life is 21Ks, that, that might be a little bit difficult. But, um, yeah, I mean, c comrades won't be, un um, that they will be um, transparent and they will be as, they'll give you as much warning as they can, as much warning as they are allowed to by government and, and Athletic South Africa. Lindsay, uh, a question popped up, and I can't find it. I was looking for it a second ago, but I thought it was a great question. Obviously, you were talking about uh, sort of speeding up and, and getting fast over 5 and 10 and, and possibly 21Ks at this time, so that will translate into, into a faster marathon time. Someone was asking, should they be doing sort of like track work and, and interval work and the high-intensity sort of stuff at this stage in their training? So not, 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 okay, again, talking to people coming out of South African lockdown, no. We need to lay some, some foundation, get going again, 
So, you know, we want to spend the next three to four, five, even six weeks really laying a foundation um, and then moving in. Yes, we would incorporate some of that exercise. Um, and hopefully Prof would have touched on, on that in, in his presentation. But as a single dose exercise, very high intensity or very, very long runs do cause a short-term immunosuppression so we would want to work on speed and we would want to do some fast sessions but we want to keep those short so we don't want high volume high intensity sessions so they might be something like four 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 hundreds or, or six four hundred so um we're not going for scientifically the best way to improve your 5k during this period in time we want to run a bit faster but we want to do it in 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 a the like a small little dose um, and then keep the rest of our training fairly um, light to, to moderate. Um, but right now we need to just give our, our bodies a little bit of time to get back to running on the road. Otherwise you're going to get injured. Um, but yes, we, we will do a, we will do some intensity and some interval type of work as we journey towards this five and 10 K. Lindsay, looking at sort of somebody who was also asking about being injured, they've come out of lockdown, they've picked up a bit of an injury. Should they be concerned about it now? What's the, what's the deal with, with having picked up an injury at this point? Look, that same, same as always, with an even bigger um, asterisk or, or, or um, aside, like get the injury sorted out. So um, you've got time. So this, what are, what are you, what are you rushing against? You know, there's no, there's no train to catch. We've got time. Um, we need to wait until we get races back on the calendar. So if you have an injury, get it treated, find out the cause of it, work on the weaknesses that are causing that injury. So strength training, um, you know, re rehabilitation, biokinetics, those kind of things. But it just makes absolutely no sense in the absence of any race in the very near future to run while you have an injury, no matter how insignificant the injury is. So rather focus on the cross training, get that injury sorted out, and then build up slowly and take your time. Um, you've, you, that's, that, that is something we've been gifted here is time. You know, we've had a lot of other things taken away from us, but we've been gifted time. Absolutely. All right. The good news is, Lindsay, we've got uh, the prof back. Prof, uh, welcome back onto the the webinar. I don't know what happened there. Apologies about that. Uh, can you can you see us and hear us? That's the most important. Not yet. Ah, let me just exit this thing and let me make sure uh, that we've. No, we still don't have him. He's connecting to audio. Should be there in a second. While we're sorting that out, Lindsay, uh, let me just see if there were any other questions coming through. Just apologies once again, folks. This is uh, the joys of streaming live. These things sort of happen. Uh, there we go. Uli asking, Lindsay, this is a, a tough question. Prof, there we go. We seem to have pictures, but there was no audio a second ago. There we go. Let me just ask this. Is fever blisters, Lindsay, I don't know if this is above your pay grade, but is uh, fever blisters the sign of a weak immune system? I, I, I don't know. So let's get Prof back on and ask him that question. I know nothing about fever blisters. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to guess. All right. Uh, let me just, I'm not sure if the Prof can hear us, but yeah. I've changed one or two settings. There we go. It looks like we, there he is. Yep. It looks like we've got a microphone. Prof, are you, are you with us? Yeah. Thanks, Brad. I'm really sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. No, no worries at all. Apologies to you. Uh, I think we can pick up pretty much where we where we left off in your slides. You were you were talking. You had just started the slide about uh, does exercise sort of affect your immune system? Yeah, okay, that's fine. You can, uh, you know, uh, give me the next slide. And you know, obviously, we're supposed to go a little bit faster. Cool. So I made the point that uh, your uh, immune system is very responsive to exercise. And um, it affects exercise affects both this innate immune system and a variety of parameters there, as well as the adaptive immunity. And so this is a sunny uh, slide, um, and it shows 
uh, how various components of the immune system, and maybe the names of these things are not that important, but you'll see in red there on the top, there's adaptive immunity, and then there's the innate immunity, and then there's inflammation. Um, and then you'll see uh, the two slides have got a, a left-hand side part and a right-hand side part. The left-hand side part is when you are running a marathon, which is a prolonged high-intensity exercise. And then perhaps when you do moderate exercise or mild exercise, um, which is when you are perhaps doing a brisk walk. And really the purpose of the slide is to just show how are two different um, uh, forms of exercise, prolonged high intensity exercise versus a mild uh, or maybe not so long and uh, of low intensity exercise affect the immune system um, in different ways. And the other point of the slide is that the magnitude of change uh, when you do a marathon versus uh, walking is very different. The marathon making uh, you know, the uh, much bigger changes in these innate and adaptive immunity compared to walking. So the point about the slide is really just to say that the, uh, an exercise session makes a big difference in terms of what the immune system does. So if we can go to the next slide. So the question is, are these changes protective or they, they, do they predispose you to infections? Now, there's a huge body of scientific knowledge about this. But if I had to summarize it in one uh, point, uh, which really point number one, that exercise is something that we as humans are actually genetically programmed to do every day or regularly. And so doing exercise regularly actually uh, initiates changes in the immune system which are protective of your immune system. So overall, the answer to this question is that exercise is very good for your immune system. There is always a, a little bit of a caveat to this, in that this protective effect is dependent on, we would call maybe the dose of exercise, and your coach, uh, Perry, will know much more about it than I do, but the overall load on your system. The second point is also dependent whether you are accustomed to this load or not. And we'll get back into these things a little bit later. And where there is perhaps a potential negative effect is when there are sudden changes, particularly increases in this exercise load. And in those circumstances, the immune system may struggle a bit and uh, you may lose some of the protective effect. Next one. Uh, I'm not going to go into this uh, question of what is low too much, except to say that when it comes to your immune system, uh, it is exercise component of so-called uh, load or stress on your system. And that we spoke about the fact that this is relative. For one person, going for a brisk walk is a very stressful um, uh, physical exercise session for them. If they are totally untrained and maybe are sick, Whereas, obviously, for someone else, that is a very light load. So, relative load is important. And then when it comes to athletes um, and other individuals, there are other components that also invoke a stress response. Uh, for instance, a psychological distress, and we all suffer from that to some extent at the moment. Uh, and then when you are working up your training, and Lindsay will know much more about that, when to a competition level or at the competition, things like travel, and so on. There are many other factors, I've just listed a few, that make up this total load. And if we look at this total load and the illness risk, um, then uh, a bit of load uh, is really the, the important part. In other words, it's the change in your load. And although this has not been that st well studied in illness, I'll show you one slide that kind of summarizes everything. And then, of course, I mentioned psychological and competition load. Next one. So this is a slide that many of you may or may not be familiar with. This is the so-called J-shaped curve of, if we look at the uh, left-hand side, the risk of developing, in this case, it's been mostly studied for upper respiratory tract uh, infections. And on the horizontal part of the slide, the, uh, what I would call the load, in other words, what I was just talking about. Uh, we are looking at a, um, 
sedentary individual, somebody who does moderate but regular exercise, and in, at times of really um, prolonged high intensity exercise. The risk uh, associated with each of these three forms of load, if you like, are different. So you'll see on the left hand side, the sedentary non exerciser um, will have a higher risk than the person who does regular exercise uh, at a moderate intensity. And the person who is perhaps undergoing this high uh, um, intensity exercise, prolonged exercise, and increases that load, there the risk can go up. I must be uh, uh, just th this, this uh, uh, J shaped curve is being challenged a little bit in that not uh, everybody believes that this tail that goes up so high with high intensity exercise is in fact 100% correct. And I'll come back to that, particularly when it comes to highly trained elite athletes in a moment. Next one. So this is a, uh, a slide that shows perhaps where these differences lie. And that is this concept of being accustomed to load. So if you've been training um, as perhaps a, an elite athlete, uh, at a high intensity and gradually increase that to develop this uh, high training load, uh, at that point, you um, are not at a higher risk uh, of infection because you're quite accustomed to that load. And that is that uh, stippled part of the graph at the bottom, and we call that a so-called S-shaped curve. So elite athletes or well-trained individuals that do uh, perform high intensity prolonged exercise do not have this uh, increase in the tail uh, that perhaps increases your risk for infection. Next slide. All right, this is a, a very important one. So if the two slides are very similar to this. And this is just uh, is one or two research uh, studies that have been done, looking at people uh, in, in uh, three groups of fitness, if you like. Low fitness, moderate or medium fitness, and high fitness. And it shows that the uh, benefits of being uh, fit and uh, training uh, are such that your risk for developing an upper respiratory tract infection in the say a three months period is substantially lower the more the fitter you are. And the next slide is exactly the same thing. It now talks about how frequently you train. Maybe the next slide please. So this is exercise days, more exercise days, highest days, coming than lower uh, exercise. Again, making the point that regular exercise training, not just a session, but regular exercise training, which is the second part of, of the benefit, uh, is also associated with a lower risk uh, of upper respiratory tract infections. Next one. Next slide. Okay, so. If I had to say to anybody, uh, even where we are right now, we've, our training and exercise may have been somewhat restricted uh, over the last couple of weeks, or in general, uh, my advice to someone in terms of exercise training, your immune system and infection, if you are a current non-exerciser, which is not the always speaking to, but perhaps your friends are, what I've just shown you in terms of the immune system, one could argue quite strongly that it's, it would be beneficial to start with low intensity exercise. Just make sure that you do see your doctor or speak to a health professional about the risk of any underlying disease, which is a completely different thing, but you can't just go and do your exercise without checking that. But it would be beneficial to you um, and your immune system if you're a current non exerciser to consider starting even with that low intensity exercise to get the drop off that you have seen on the J-shaped curve. If you are a, rec a regular, maybe recreational, and it could be a serious recreational exerciser, then uh, what you need to do is keep doing your, uh, uh, your exercise. That is keeping your training load up, uh, stimulating your immune system constantly, don't stop. Maybe the only thing is if you do increase your training load, do it gradually. And that's perhaps pertinent right now is in some cases, maybe because of our restrictions, the training load uh, was possibly a little bit less. So don't go back to where you were six weeks ago. For an elite athlete, uh, again, it's a question of keep training. And yet of preparation for uh, competitions or races, it's important to the discuss, discuss your training load and how you manage that, particularly a gradual increase in training load. And I spoke briefly about the acute and chronic load ratio. 
uh, is an important consideration in terms of the immune system. Next slide. Just uh, a few last words on uh, if you have an infection, uh, the question sometimes is when can we train again? Well, currently, uh, I probably get uh, numerous emails every day about this right now. It's a very hot topic. Uh, to prevent an infection. And we spoke about the training component, but there are many other things, and we know this is in our in the media constantly and on SMSs about what we need to do to prevent our infections, uh, not only from our personal hygiene, but also other things like nutrition and uh, psychological stress. The advice that we would give to someone to start training after infection um, differs uh, and a number of things have to be taken into account. Uh, the infection type or the organism is important. Uh, there are some bugs that are much more damaging than others. Um, and we're learning a lot about COVID-19 right now. It seems to be a particularly, um, let's call it more severe type of infection than perhaps some of the other viruses. The next question is whether this target of the infection um, was uh, the skin. So you can get skin infections, which perhaps are not as serious when it comes going, to going back to training, but your heart muscle is very important and your respiratory tract, your lungs are very important. The third consideration that we, uh, that we look at is the severity. In general, we would call a mild infection. And again, this is mostly with upper respiratory or respiratory tract infections. A mild infection where the symptoms are very short duration, like up to two days, moderate maybe up to a week and more severe up to seven days and again coming back to COVID-19 there are a certain percentage of people maybe a higher percentage than in other viruses that experience a much more severe infection with this virus and then the other question that we ask ourselves is whether or not this infection is very prolonged in other words is your immune system struggling or is it complicated in that it affects many organs not to say the, um, the nose, the upper respiratory tract. And these are all considerations that are important with a decision to get back to training. Next one. I'm going to skip this one uh, because of time, but it essentially comes down to basic principles uh, in terms of in illness prevention. And the infographic that we produced uh, about two years ago to help athletes, particularly at the Olympic Games, is actually what is the message that is being spread uh, around and uh, is very important to adhere to with respect to preventing. But it is things like hand washing and, and uh, hygiene with respect to sneeze and uh, covering nose and social isolation or physical distancing, I should say, uh, nutrition, etc. So I'm not going to dwell on this slide. Maybe go on to the next slide which is maybe um, uh, how we uh, would uh, approach it from a medical point of view. And I'm going to just simplify those steps for you. And that is if somebody if a me and says to me, Martin, uh, I need to uh, follow some steps about, you know, how to get back to training. So the first step that we look at is we look at if there is a general body involvement uh, with the symptoms, not just a runny nose or a blocked nose, but have you got a fever, muscle aches and pains, general fatigue, etc.? If that is the case, we advise not to train. And so those would be the first things that you can ask yourself, is if you've got those symptoms, then don't. If you don't have any symptoms, does it mean that you can just go back to training? And <clears throat> we're a little bit more cautious because we understand that some viruses and bacteria can have other organs that uh, can be affected, like we spoke about the heart and so on. So the next part is to look for those, uh, for evidence that any other organs are involved. In other words, do you have any other symptoms like constant muscle aches and pains, uh, shortness of breath, uh, if you've got a heart rate monitor on your device that you're using a sustained or constant high resting heart rate. These would all be indications that you uh, perhaps have other organs that were involved, not just your uh, nose for example. Next one. Just click on it, there we go. If that's not the case, then the next step that you're probably almost ready to go. And then my advice to you would be to go uh, for a, <clears throat> a, an exercise session. In your case, it would be running. You go for a run uh, for a short period, 10, 15, 20 minutes, not at full intensity, and monitor these symptoms I was talking about. Monitor your heart rate, monitor how you feel you're breathing, monitor how you feel 
your legs are. And if they're normal and there are no symptoms, you can continue with this um, uh, lower intensity. It's a moderate session, maybe not as long. And then still, uh, and this is a very important part, still gradually increase your training load over the next couple of days or weeks. And if you develop any symptoms uh, while you're in this gradual buildup, then you may have to go and uh, take the feelings off. And if they don't resolve, then you go and see your doctor again about that. So this would be a general approach on uh, making a decision, a good decision about getting back to training once you've finished. Next one. Um, again, I think, uh, Brad, in, for interest sake, and perhaps uh, I'll just mention it, that nowadays we are becoming much more specific with uh, special swabs. I mean, you've all seen everybody doing swabs at various test centers. We've been doing these swabs for the last two, three years where we can identify specific viruses. And we now know that specific viruses and bacteria also determine that uh, duration before we can get back to training and how we get back to training. But I don't think I'm going to uh, dwell too much on that. Maybe you can just flip through the next two, three slides. Um, and uh, I think I can just like to summarize right at the end. So you can flip through this one and also the next one. Um, uh, that's got just a pattern of how, uh, there we go. Maybe let's just uh, finish off with this uh, and just uh, summarize uh, this evening's talk. Does exercise affect your immune system? Yes, definitely does. Your uh, immune system is very responsive to exercise. We spoke about acute sessions, spoke about how to increase the exercise and also what regular training does. Does it protect or predispose you? Well, it protects you by and large. And the only thing we spoke about, one of the things to be aware of is very high increases in training load. If you have an infection and when you can train, well, no symptoms or mildly resolving symptoms with no whole body symptoms and no complicated infection that other organs get affected, you can go back to training. Start with a lower intensity and duration and monitor for the abnormal body responses as you go and increase that. Stop if you're not well. And just remember to uh, you know, follow the general principle of a grab return to full training over days, monitoring yourself constantly. I think uh, let's call it at that, and I'm really happy to uh, maybe answer any questions if there are any. Prof, that was a, that was amazing. I love that sort of like flow chart with regards to to sort of should you be training, and that's a question that Lindsay gets on nearly every single one of these webinars that we do. So that's definitely one uh, that we'll keep for the archives because I think it's vitally important. If you've got any questions, please do pop them. <coughs> excuse me, please do pop them into the chat box uh, below this video. And uh, we'll get to those. I see there are still a few coming through. Please do keep them coming. I uh, just wanted to share a few running resources with you to keep you going uh, over this period as well. Don't forget that we put out weekly audio podcast is the Run With Coach Parry podcast as well as the Ask Coach Parry podcast. Uh, you can get those through our website. We also do weekly videos. All you need to do is go to coachparry.com forward slash YouTube. That's where you can find those. Uh, comrades.com uh, you can get a whole bunch of resources there too uh, as well as the replays of the comrades uh, the body test comrades webinars those are available we've also got a home based strength training program that you can do at home just go to coachparry.com uh, we also are putting on three live strength training classes a week as well through Coach Perry. Uh, just go to coachparry.com forward slash lockdown. Uh, and this time of your training, it's quite tough to obviously stay motivated to keep training when there are no races on the horizon. Lindsay spoke uh, quite extensively about trying to get faster over the shorter distances. And uh, you're on Facebook. I know you are. So uh, you'll know there are a million people telling you a million different things. Uh, you always second guessing yourself if you're anything like me and you're not quite sure what you should be doing, how much you should be doing and when you should be doing it. So I want you to imagine a place where you can get access to training programs from 5Ks right through to Comrades that tells you exactly what to run, what paces you should be running at, as well as access to a team of qualified coaches. And you get access to a group of runners just like you who can help motivate and hold you accountable as well. And that's exactly what we do at coachparry.com. You get access to all our training programs uh, through our ios and android app as well uh, there's over 100 different training programs from 5k right through to comrades and everything in between 10 21 42 the works with training paces included you get access to the coaches you can chat to them daily in the forums those live uh, strength classes as well 
and weekly members only calls too like these except they're a lot smaller and a lot more intimate uh, and then obviously that motivation and accountability uh, there's over a thousand athletes from around the world in there too at the moment uh, if you want to follow a training plan proven and backed by science it gives you direct access to the expert that wrote it so no more guesswork all you need to do is head over to coachparry.com forward slash join if you would like to find out more about that uh, just checking. There we go. Great question from Alan. And I'm going to throw it to both of you. I don't know who would be more appropriate to answer it. But Alan's asking, is supplementing with vitamins essential to staying healthy during times like these and generally? No, I'm happy for happy for Prof to grab that one. Otherwise, I have my, my uh, view, but it's not completely based in science. Um, so the general answer to that question, thanks, Alan, it's a good one, um, is that uh, unfortunately for most people, if you take lots of supplements, including many vitamins and so forth, it's not a, uh, a quick fix or a cure for your immune system. Uh, the most important thing is actually to follow a, a healthy diet in general. Um, and we can argue about what that is, but it's the fruit and vegetables mostly that contain the substances which are very important for your immune system, uh, including antioxidants. So that would be a short answer to that. So first uh, step is to uh, follow a normal healthy diet or make sure you get your fruit and vegetable uh, portions per day. Um, and only in circumstances where perhaps you haven't got access to this or you can't, that, a, uh, that supplements can possibly help. I don't know, Lindsay, if you want to add to that. No, I mean, I think as a, as a general principle, um, multivitamin supplementation probably leads mostly to expensive we so um, there is a place for it uh, particularly if you are struggling to get um, adequate nutrition or, or, or there are of obvious deficiencies in in your nutrition but by and large just taking vitamins um, for the sake of taking multivitamins is is not shown to uh, boost the uh, boost the immune system um, and also bear in mind that certain certain um, um, enzymes and um, micro and macro macronutrients are in essence designed to work together and get absorbed uh, together so if you are taking multivitamins uh, or, or, or need to take some sort of, sort of supplementation always do that with with the advice of a of a dietitian or, or sports physician because those things are supposed to be taken in combination so if you're short for example of something like iron or calcium you would take that in conjunction with something else to to improve that absorption cool prof uh, we got a question that i asked lindsay when you got bumped off the call and they've it's been asked again i'm going to ask you a double whammy so uh, maruska was asking are fever blisters the sign of uh a compromised immune system and then Saul was asking is do omega-3s lower your uh, inflammation levels in your body um, so fever first question fever blisters can be a an indication um, they often uh, or they can some of these uh, things can be reactivation of a virus that's dormant in your system so if you're um, if your um, immune system is compromised maybe undergoing uh, periods of stress or perhaps uh, uh, you are um, uh, exposed to another infection, then fever blisters can develop. Um, Omega-3s um, Omega are generally uh, uh, given, uh, again, uh, we spoke about supplements. There's some evidence that they are protective uh, for a variety of chronic conditions, including uh, heart disease. And heart disease is linked to a low-grade chronic inflammation. So there are some benefits to that. Uh, is it very strong evidence? Not, not, not really. Um, and again, if you, uh, you know, have a healthy, balanced diet, uh, uh, maybe where you are bad in Cape Town, here in Pretoria, we don't have that. But if you have fish, then uh, fish oils and so on contain these uh, protective, um, uh, you know, natural substances. And uh, you know, if you have access to those kind of foods, then you don't have to. Uh, otherwise, omega threes may be of value. Again, it's quite expensive, but you know you you can consider that. I got quite excited there, Prof. I thought you were going to tell me red wine, but then I also realised we can't get any at this time, unfortunately. Uh, and then <laughs> final question, quick, 
from Stain. Stain wanted to know if it's true that eating a combination of protein and carbs 20 minutes after uh, exercise, does that improve your immune system or is that, is that a, an old wives' tale? Uh, no, there's not. Uh, maybe, Lindsay, you can comment on that. I mean, that would be important. Those would be important nutrients for recovery from the exercise session, but as a, um, a boost for your immune system, not really. Having said that, um, there is some evidence that if you, uh, during exercise, uh, your blood sugar drops a lot, uh, you become hyperglycemic. Um, that adds another stressor to the immune system. So if you Google hyperglycemia or low blood sugar immune system exercise, you'll find a research scientist by the name of David Neiman who's done quite a lot of research on that. But again, if you follow normal nutrition and good practice of uh, how you uh, make sure that your energy requirements are met during a race or during a training run, then that shouldn't really be a problem. Fabulous. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Prof. Uh, your time is extremely valued. Uh, we have unfortunately run slightly over, so apologies about that. But uh, yeah, I think the information was, was very well received. We had some great questions. Uh, Lindsay, for you as always as well, thank you for your time too. Any parting shots from, from your side before we, we, we call it quits? And, and also just before I do hand it over to you, a massive thank you to Bonnie Tess for making these webinars possible. The next one coming up in a month from now, if you head over to coachparry.com forward slash webinar, that's where you'll be able to get all the details. So uh, Lindsay, final, final words from you. Um. Yeah, actually not a lot. Mostly just to say thanks to, to Prof. Martin Schwalness. Um, loads of, of fantastic insights. And I think that the message there is, is um, very clear. If you haven't done much exercise, start doing some, but start slowly and build up. If you have been exercising um, and have been exercising quite hard, then you are um, fine to continue doing so in the same vein. So I think that the message for both the reduction of injury risk um, as well as, as maintaining mentally fresh and from the immune side is the same. Start out slowly, build up over time, and there isn't a major risk because we don't have any events on the horizon. So use, use this opportunity wisely. There you go. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe, and we look forward to catching up again soon. Cheers.